blah. So, and if you see, Lapsor is a noun, so your noun class language. If you see the data on the board, you will see that the, the, the noun for, for bed is kikun, okay? And the plural of that, of bed, is bikun, okay? So we have kiwo for hand, and diwo for hand, and kibam for back, and dibam for back. So if you want to change from singular to plural, you just take ki to vi. And then there is another class that has shinun for bird, for bird, and then minun for bird. And you continue like that. So if, if for that class, if you want to change from plural, from singular to plural, you just change the she to men. Now, look at the problem this, this, this kind of uh, this kind of language is called. This is probably what is generally referred to as an agreement-based grammar. And so if you have a, you remember our shinun for bed, so if you want to say, this bed is mine, you will say something like, shinun shin, shi the shin. So you have this agreement that speaks that speaks across words. Now in the same light, in the same light, if you if you now take the plural of birds to say these birds are mine, you will now have menun mem mem mem. Now the more interesting thing here that I'm trying to point out here is that there is a need to study each language for its own futures. That this concept of Universal grammar, where all languages are being smoothed in one part, is not contributing to the study of the grammars of the languages of Africa. It is the claim that if you do not get in to study the lexical computation of these words, you will never ever get to understand the grammar of the language. And then that is, ladies and gentlemen, the negative, uh, the neg negative uh, contributions that they insist on these mentalist languages that are generally Eurocentric. Are bringing to us now, and and I can continue with the uh, same thing. So you have key, 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 and you have B, B, B. Now, in in an attempt to simulate all languages and put them in one little basket, Chomsky, 1995, brought up this uh, this contraption. It is generally made reference to as the Y shaped model for uh, economic derivation within the minimalist program. And unfortunately, oh my God. Now, you, if you look very carefully, you will see that um, there are language resources. And the concept with this is that you have these derivational operations that, that are on to, to our address, yes, to our right uh, operations, and there are derivational operations, operation select, operation agree, operation move, operation transfer. And it is understood that they have to select from the language resources there. There is what, what is the portion that is in bracket is the numeration, what used to be called the working area. And the PF and the LF there are the phonetic forms and the logical forms. That lower form is always called the interface, the interface, um, the interface level, uh, which judges the grammar. So the operation select and the operation merge, select from lexical resources, and then operation combine, uh, uh, operation merge and transfer, put them together, and then that combination is judged at the interface level. Now, if you go back to our, our concept of lexical computation, where we had key, key, and me, me, and all of that, you will see that the explanation of how this, the selection of lexical resources is done does not take into context the agreement grammars like the one we saw for Lamsoft. So if operation select does not take into consideration Agreement in its selection, most of what it selects will be joined as ill form at the uh, interface level. There are also context sensitive grammars, not just languages with, uh, with, um, with uh, non class languages. Now, this, this, I've taken this data from my friend and student, uh, Kekai, who is seated right here in front of us, 2011. And this is from his own. And you have A, B, C, D, G, up to G. They are verbs of fishing. So you have Pele, which is to fish with the cutlass and muddy waters. Then Owin, to fish with in a pool of, uh, by bending water. And the last one, to fish with a hook. So each word, each choice of, each, each verb choice there, builds a, con a context within which the fishing is done. But all of them are verbs of fishing. And then we can uh, this is the data that makes up uh, the sentences from, from all those from, from all those. Now it is 
necessary to say that these examples show that competence in his own requires the mastery of the inherent futures of each of these verbs. It, 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 it requires the knowledge of the type of fish the verb selects, the adequate fishing uh, instrument, that is the argument structure, the place within which the, the fishing occurs, that is the domain, and the type of event the, the type of fishing, and that's event structure. A mismatch of these selectional restrictions results into deviant structures. These restrictions occur in the realm of over syntax. And like I said, unfortunately, the mentalist universalist approach to language studies are largely inefficient in interrogating the context sensitive grammars like that of his own. Now we turn to the second part of this lecture, which probably will be more interesting and less technical. Now, uh, cognition and optimum output. In simplistic, in simplistic terms, cognition is the process of furtherance of human activity through the application of thought and experience. It is the information of knowledge. It is the formation of knowledge, the activation of reasoning and working memory towards problem evaluation and problem, problem solving and decision making. Cognitive science has been studied from different perspectives like neuroscience, psychiatry, systemic logic, computer science, and linguistics. Part of the assumption of mentalism is that the language knowledge is something in the brain of the speaker, that thought has been conceived as inner speech, while speech is said to be outer thought. The link between thought and speech has led scholars to investigate the appropriate transfer of inner speech as outer thought. Some of the questions that have propelled this research are generally, why are normal children, why are normal children able to fully acquire language at the age of six and yet spend a lifetime in cognition? Why are stutras, what you call stamina, unable to speak fluently and yet they are able to sing effortlessly? And why are people judged as intelligent or dull? civilized or primitive, educated or uneducated, only after having listened to them speak a few sentences. And lastly, what is the link between what we say and what we know? At independence, African leaders inherited a colonial system set up to run in European languages for the benefit of Europeans. Africans have failed to re-examine this system and recalibrate them to serve the people of independent, independent Africa. The burning language question for most multilingual African nations has been the failure to make informed decisions about which indigenous languages should be elevated as official languages, national languages, regional languages, ETC. These languages have been seen as a source of national disintegration and consistently treated with contempt. So the question, ladies and gentlemen, is that a right? Is if the language with which we express our thoughts is this important, how have we treated these languages? The European Union officially speaks in 24 European languages. The African Union speaks in six languages, five of which are European. Why, for instance, has the African Union continued to use European languages as languages of official discourse, even when all of us know that not all African heads of state are intelligible in these official languages? And I brought up, I got this from um, the uh, website of the African Union. And you can see that from all these languages that are being used in the African Union, that only one language there, which is Iswahili, is indigenous to Africa. And, and we have failed to take appropriate decisions in our language choices. This week alone, the week that's running out, I think that was on, it came out on Monday or so, Rwanda has adopted Iswahili as her official language, downgrading both French and English. Uh, the French, uh, like they have 14 
in the former colonial power, colonial uh, territories in Africa, and they have virtually dragged down all each and each and every one of these colonies. And uh, if you know the uh, this 1958 uh, agreement of uh, the continuation of colonization, okay, which um, has terrible causes, I invite you to check it out and look particularly at clause six at how the Africans under the French have been elected to uh, eternally slave uh, themselves. So the ignorant view that African languages are inadequate for education, science, and abstract thought. And it is for this reason that children are not being encouraged to speak African languages. Another big problem for Africa and African languages, especially for English, has been the misinterpretation of problems. Sometimes we are not interpreting our problem correctly. For instance, Anthony Gardner and Ace argues that the death of monolingual dictionaries for African languages is a communication disorder that bilingual dictionaries play a prominent role in promoting and sustaining this type of communication uh, communication disorder. Yuka and Apologia 2011 examine Ampani's exciting claim and note that one, that the lexicon of any language is an open is open and expands as the physical and emotional experiences of the speaker's develop. Two, that no normal human being can possibly internalize a complete lexicon of any language. And three, that lexical death is the end onset of language death generally triggered by relevant situation. And finally, that dictionaries are more a means of language documentation and preservation rather than an enhancing tool for language acquisition. Mr. White Chancellor, there have also been faulty statistics. Udemy, and for those of us who know, understand the language, languages, especially of the uh, Middle North area, Udemy is a heritage language of an identically named people dispersed across the northern part of Edo State in Nigeria. It is a region commonly referred to as Edo North. Ethnologue, on the other hand, is a post of up-to-date up -to -date information about all the languages of the world. In 2016, I stumbled on Ethnologue's claim that the language status of Unimi was, six, was categorized at 6A, which means that it was bigger. I had reasons to doubt this categorization, given my familiarity with the languages of the Edo uh, area. Yuka and Biogene 2017 investigated lexical attrition and language shift among the Unimi, Unimi through questionnaires, word this illustration, storytelling tasks, and observations made in the field, and from our analysis, we reveal the following. That lexical attrition is patterned in relation to the location and generation of speakers. With the decline of lexical skills, lexical access to tribal and production being the most severe among the younger generation of the Onim in the diaspora. We also noted that the decline was evident in the older generation of Unime diaspora and in the, than in the younger uh, speakers resident in the local territory. And again, there was also little evidence for lexical attrition in the older generation of speakers resident in the locality back at Unime. Language shift passes primarily in relation with the generation of speakers, the older speakers exhibiting a higher preference for the language in communication domain than the younger speakers who have generally replaced Unimi with English as the language of choice in communicative context except with the parent. Mr. Vice Chancellor, I am glad to report that the publication of this research in Concentric Studies in Linguistics number 42, issue 3, has forced ethnologues to revisit their classification status from, of Unimi from 6A liberals to 6B. Such, such impact, the point we are making here is that such inaccurate statistics are affecting the revitalization of threatened language. There have also been faulty language planning steps. On the 4th of December, for example, 1996, General Sadi Abada the then Nigerian head of state declared that Nigeria for henceforth was to adopt French as our second official language. Abata recognized the lack of communication posed by the linguistic barrier to the total integration of the sub region. General Abata then expressed the need for official bilingualism for Nigeria within the shortest possible time. Yuka 
2005 examined the implementation of the additives of this new policy and made the following observations. That the effective day to day pursuit of the average Nigerian does not require the knowledge or use of French as a language of interaction within the national boundaries. That two, that official bilingualism is an expensive policy to implement. That if you were to implement official bilingualism in, in, in Nigeria, for instance, you will require doubling manpower, you will require uh, uh, translating all government uh, 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 documents, and you will probably have uh, two newscasts, two different sets of newscasters, some casting the same news in English and some casting the same news in French. We said that this policy didn't find factor in the need to train teachers of French. That books, the books that reflect the Nigerian environment needed to be written and employed in the teaching of teachers and the students. And that more, Nigerian, more than more Nigerians speak Pidgin. Chico, Hausa, Yoruba, Edo, and a plethora of other indigenous languages that speak French. At that time, we wondered why General Abacha had to take this faulty policy, faulty faulty policy, policy state. You know, we found out that within his reign, um, Nigeria has almost become a barrier nation. Nigeria has been kicked out of the Commonwealth, kicked out of the UN, and he even kicked himself out of the, uh, the African nations of that was holding in, 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 South, in South Africa. And, but as the French, as, as they, are, they are always sneaky looking around for what they did not give, the French showed him friendship. And because of that, he turned around and declared French as Nigeria. But what more, is, what more interest, interesting is, is that they were not doing that for nothing. Because General Bacha then transferred Nigeria's foreign reserve into the French uh, national <laughs> Now, we have the linguistic diversity. Language diversity in Africa has been viewed as a problem rather than as a resource. This problem has been tagged the African language question. It is the fact that Africa is made up of people, and these people, before the, uh, uh, the event of colonization, spoke different languages, and there have been language loyalty, and the governments have reacted towards these languages uh, in preference of neutral languages because they think that if they adopt Yoruba as, of, as Nigeria's official language, the Igbos will rise and say, no, this is uh, our own country. If it is Hausa, they will say, no, this is, uh, you know, um, they are trying to uh, elevate the Hausa against us. So, in, you, in 2007, you can propose, you can 2017, propose what is called the no language left behind schema, what you're seeing on board as an answer to this African language question. This schema associates any language of preference within the diversified speech community with its rule as its optimum functional communication. The gist behind all of this is that it may look complicated, but it, 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 it isn't. Is that if you, if you are like myself, who is married to a lady from another linguistic extraction, and you want your family to uh, communicate functionally effectively, then you must sit down and do some language planning. In which language are the children going to be speaking? Are they going to be speaking the wife's language or are they going to be speaking your own language? And generally, you know the way women are, and that has nothing to do with my wife. Generally, uh, when you get married, uh, you have one auntie comes, then one cousin comes, then uh, the, the mother of your wife comes for Omogo and all of that. All of a sudden, you find out that, and sometimes the house, the house help also comes from your wife's extraction. And I encourage that for family harmony. You know, and uh, if you are a very smart person, you will know that the functional language in that house must be the language of your wife. <laughs> Uh, 
takes care of agitations from linguistic minorities. You can speak all languages are, 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 are accommodated, but the most functional language within a particular scene is chosen. And we are looking at functionality in the sense that language specifically is a tool of communication. And look, you can be as attached to your language as whatever you want to call it. But if you go to an extraction, if you love uh, Edo so much, and you go to Ntuka, for instance, your Edo will not save you. You will have to feel you have to function. You will have to use the language that can buy you tatashe in the market and buy your pan and yam and buy something in the restaurant. So language is a tool of communication, and we should stop these linguistic affiliations. Now, Mr. Vice Chancellor, advances in technology have shrunk our world demographically. Our world is more connected today than it was 20 years ago. Money, information, and images now instantly travel through the globe. Technology-driven economies have brought unprecedented work to those who have seized the moment. Currently, Google Trap is translated in 57 languages, which is not even 1% of the world's languages. 18 of these languages are Indo-European languages, and none is African. We cannot stand by, Mr. Vice and simply watch the world change as onlookers would in a fight between strangers. We have the responsibility to shape the world of our dreams. Our worldview is defined by our very position. Our languages and our cultures influence that worldview. When we abandon the languages in which we dream and do business in alien, in languages alien to our culture and worldview, our languages in which our competence is approximate, our endeavor in the development of our institution, construct, and social process tends to fall short of the appropriate level. In this slide, Yuka and Onyeka, fourth coming, have, have, have started to a test project to digitize street names in Aero, the local government area of Edo State. And you can see uh, that Google, Google, Google this is a, a, a screenshot of Google Maps. That long street is this street that leads faculty of arts uh, to this uh, auditorium. And, um, and uh, it, that, it, that street is called, generally called uh, uh, Ethiopian River Road. But Google will pronounce it as Ethiopian River Road. Google will, so if you look very closely, you can also see Uselu. Google will pronounce it as Uselu. So what we are trying to do is to make sure that uh, the motivation is to use Lexipro to compile all your lists of these street names and associate them with Google Maps through the application that can be installed in cars and uh, Android phones. There are also these emojis. You can see that constantly we are, being, we are now communicating through the use of emojis. If, um, uh, you know, how ah, are you, somebody will put something that, um, you know. Now, emojis are small pictures that represent words and actions. These emojis are being used on Facebook and, and Messenger. Now, um, we have, in recognition of this, and the, the argument has been that those, those images do not represent our culture and our worldview. And um, in recognition of this inadequacy applied to us now, uh, Yuka and Idaida forthcoming have compiled a digital dictionary of uh, emojis for the languages of southern Nigeria. We have employed the Lexic Pro again and Visual Studios 2017 to enable us create emojis that are equipped uh, with uh, pre-recorded audio Nigerian languages that appropriately represent our culture and our world. And those are, we don't have the time, we have a sample of the one we have to And then in the, in the first one, you can see if you, if you press it, if you, if, you, if you put your cursor on that one, it, it will not only show you what we generally call waka, it will also pronounce the waka. And on the other, the last one the back, is what we call koba atokwe. And um, you know, and we have, we have it here, we can we go through it. is 
now being sold in Amazon, and even people who have never come to Nigeria know about the US. That is how to promote the languages of Africa. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, the linguistic situation in Cameroon is perhaps one of the most complex in Africa. The country officially speaks in French, English, and has 283 languages spoken within its national territory. And there exists a very vibrant region that serves as a lingua franca. The British Cameroon has been agitating against, if you look at the map, you will see uh, what used to be the, the British Cameroon, what is now being called Amazonia, uh, and they speak English. But that little part has been agitating uh, against marginalization by the bigger French Cameroon for 57 years now. In October 2016, these agitations metamorphosed into street protests. The brutal response from the government of Yaoundé led to the death of plenty of civilians. A hitherto call for the respect of English territories, of English traditions and cultures has now spiraled into a bitter armed conflict between the restorationists demanding for the independence of the state of uh, Southern Cameroon and the Republican forces fighting to keep Cameroon one. As I speak to you from this podium, a very bitter genocidal war is raging in Southern Cameroon. The United Nations High Commission Refugees estimates that over 3,000 Southern Cameroon, Cameroonians are incarcerated in different prisons and station camps within the, the national territory. That more than 2,000 people have been killed, 437,000 internally displaced people, uh, and over 70,000 Cameroonians are battling for survival in refugee camps in the Cross River. Then it is a scorched death policy that has led to the burning of entire villages, schools and hospitals within Southern Cameroon. Shops, businesses and the economy of livelihood of Southern Cameroon has been literally destroyed. The government of Cameroon will have the world believe that this is a, a linguistic conflict between French and English speaking uh, citizens. Even if this were true, it, it is as shameful as it is idiotic that citizens of a country will openly abandon the over 283 languages uh, and up to kill themselves over two foreign languages. But the truth here is that this is a conflict about the concept of self. It is the quest for a national identity and a bitter fight over the control of natural resources in southern Cameroon. My thesis here is that English and French speaking Cameroonians do not hate themselves. Linguistic diversity is not a source of conflict. National disintegration or, or national disintegration, marginalization of uh, inappointment, the distribution of national resources, poor infrastructure, and, and more potent, uh, potent, uh, more potent sources of conflict. And if you look at that source, all these people who are educating, you can see a, a small placard which is being raised, which reads, we have no roads, no jobs, no water. That really are the sources of conflict and not language diversity. Recommendations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. To my mind, each human being stands a better chance to vividly communicate his inner thoughts, conceptions and worldview when he or she employs his language of optimum competence as his tool of communication. Our, co our cognition and abstract thoughts are clearly and easily expressed in the language in which we dream. If that language for you and I is our mother tongue, then that is the best language with which we should engage the world. For the mother tongue to yield its optimum value output as a tool of communication, effective language planning is required. Language planning is a deliberate effort to influence the language function, structure acquisition, variation by government, non-governmental organizations, and individuals within speech communities. We must be smart enough to cast away ineffective communication tools. For, the, for this change to happen, linguists must lead in defining the strategies of approach, the study of, of African languages through the application of mentalist Eurocentric theories has not been an effective approach in the study of these languages. Studies that seek to collect and analyze what is the compilation of dictionaries, the exploration of language structures, the writing of grammars, and investigations that reveal how speech structures re reflect the speaker's worldview is, to my mind, a better path to follow to the study and the development of the languages of Africa. It is the responsibility of African governments to, to, to
to redirect the energies of his ministries and agencies to the planning and development of indigenous languages which their citizens employ effectively as their vehicle of thought and expression. For nearly 60 decades, Africans have tried foreign languages as languages of government, education, business, expression of thought, and the general results have been abysmal. The time to turn to our own languages is here. Governments and politicians must be bold enough to implement expert recommendations on language planning and indigenous language development and rise above political correctness and the preference for the neutral foreign languages, which are, to my mind, the low hanging fruit. Conclusion. In this lecture, I have relied on all evidence that links the human brain with language processing to posit that cognition and language and the language of expression are related. Now, to my mentality and my preference for the mother tongue as an instrument of critical thinking and convey of inner speech as afterthought, I have argued that our ability to transfer critical thinking into optimum output is partly dependent on our competence in the languages we have chosen as our communication tool. That language two proficiency consistently reduces the ability of the user in the higher order of discourse, processing, and deep learning. I have posited that part of the bad, uh, that apart from bad leadership, nepotism, ethnicism, ethnicity, sorry, and corruption, that our inability to make the right linguistic choices is part of the reason that Africa and Africans have remained permanently on the starting line of the, of the development race. Our mother tongues are, very, are a very valuable tool for our national development that have been, ab and they have been abandoned for too long. I have attempted to share with you a few thoughts about the role of language in human cognition, the impact of the pursuit of mentalism in the study of African languages, and my call for a redirection in the current approaches to the study of African languages. It is obvious that technology has demographically shown our today's world. Rather than start by and what change happens, we must seize the moment and contribute to this change. Our voices in the change room will be more distinct, assertive, and potent when we engage our audience in our languages of optimum competence. Let us extract our mother tongues from the kitchens, ethnic meetings, and city slums, and employ them as our weapons of change. The mother tongue is the most efficient expression tool to the locked potentials of our thoughts. Let us engage them in critical thinking in the quest for solutions of our immediate problems. For Africa and Africa, who have rejected the mother tongue, we must now bring back the rejected corner, the rejected cornerstone as the headstone of the corner. Mr. Vice
College of Medical Sciences. Professor Vincent Yahweh will want to welcome you to the rest of the session. Professor Chike Okoloja will recognize you, sir. We welcome you. Professor Mike Amabrali has asked me to welcome you very specially so as not to get me down. Uh, we want to let you know that our problem is not uh, our mother tongue, so that when I speak beneath for you, you should no longer get me down. We want to recognize the presence of the first inaugural lecturer from the Department of Linguistic Studies and uh, a member of the OACEP University of Antonina, Professor Victor Adosa of Montreal. Students, you don't go there. 